Hello, I'm Meta Parlakar from Casper Labs, building next-gen NFT technology to help enterprises generate more revenue and savings. I'm here on Edge of NFT, the show that's covering next-gen NFT technology to help disruptors globally make an impact on the world. Keep listening. Hey, NFT curious listeners, stay tuned for today's episode to learn how the new CEP78 standard will reshape the NFT landscape for enterprise use cases and why our guest today thinks we were not and are not in a bear market. Finally, what might be a powerful and overlooked use of blockchain to increase the safety of AI? And yes, it's official. You can now dive into the captivating world of artificial intelligence with Edge of AI podcast, our other show. Join us as we explore the frontiers of AI and its impact on our lives. Subscribe now on your favorite podcast platform and follow us on Twitter at Edge of underscore AI and LinkedIn for exciting updates and insights. You can also visit our new website at edgeofai.xyz. Welcome to the Edge of NFT, the podcast that brings you the top 1% of Web3 today and what will stand the test of time. We explore the nuts and bolts of the business side and also the human element of how Web3 is changing the way we interact with the things we love. This podcast is for the dreamers, disruptors, and doers who are pumped about this ecosystem and driving where it goes next. And today is a special new recurring segment, Edge of Casper, where we're catching up with the team at Casper every month, keeping on the pulse of this rapid expanding ecosystem and bringing exclusive updates and insights straight from the heart of the action. For those that don't already know, Casper Association is a nonprofit entity based in Switzerland dedicated to overseeing Casper Network's development, ensuring its ongoing decentralization, and it's comprised of independent validators running nodes on the network. The association also fosters organic growth. And in parallel, Casper Labs, which is a Swiss-based AG, actively contributes to the Casper blockchain code base and operates as a comprehensive enterprise consultancy, providing support and services to clients built on Casper since its exception in October of 2018. And this regular segment is sponsored by our friends at Casper, who also supported our Edge of Asia series. And today we're going to talk with Medhar Palkar about the Casper network, and she's a very special return guest. It's great to have you on the show again, Medhar. Thank you so much, Josh, for having me on board. Really happy to be here. You're very welcome. Um, so Mena is the co-founder and CTO of Casper Labs, and she has over 30 years of tech experience. She's considered one of the top women in blockchain, started working in technology in the early 80s, building computers in the basement. And for the past two decades, she's been delivering production SaaS software for large companies like Adobe, uh, Amateur, and Avarlara. And her strengths are building high-functioning technical teams and inspiring them to do great things and solve big problems. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I guess I just want to start, um, off by, by sort of talking about, uh, what's been going on since, uh, we left, uh, hanging out together in Asia. Of course, um, we got to be part of that celebration event for killer whales, which is a lot of fun, but we didn't really catch up on sort of the details of what's been going on with, with you and in the world of, of Casper labs. Um, so why don't we start there? Like what's, what's new in your world? Oh gosh. So, you know, at Casper Labs, we are, we're focused on the enterprise adoption of the Casper technology, right? So our big focus has been around developing products that use the Casper technology. And we've got some very exciting internal initiatives that we've been developing and building. And we're looking forward to seeing some of those hit the ground and launch here in the coming months. So lots of um, exciting developments on the technical front. Cool, cool. Um, and how how long in the the building process have have some of these developments been? So some of them we've been working on for about ninety to one hundred and twenty days. So it's in the order of three to four months. Uh, you know, from actual actual coding, um, the design and ideation phase probably took another two to three months prior to that, right? So where you have an initiative, you come up you come up with a product idea, and then you go into designing and writing out the functional requirements, and then actually into implementation, right? And and testing. So it's a fairly extensive process to, you know, ideate, do the research, ideate, come up with a design and then, you know, build a product and then get it to market. Yeah. Uh, you know, I know you've been at this a, a long time. I, I'm, I'm curious with, with Casper in particular, have your sprints sort of um, 
increased in length or have you sort of elongated them or they've been about the same um since since the jump just in in terms of the 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 life cycle of development with these with these different products we stick to the same you know life cycle development life cycle about two weeks you know the 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 duration of a sprint really is more about how frequently you want to check in on progress than it is in terms of the overall like duration of the of the larger project plan, right? We still use the sprint methodology when we build out the core protocol upgrades and updates that you know when we contribute to that code base. Um, so we still use a you know a two week sprint uh, iteration there because we feel that that gives us the right cadence to track progress against uh, work planned work. Cool. And have the overall life cycles been about six months at a time, or, or you know, kind of on a quarterly sort of basis? Um, over over the protocol, the- yes, for the core protocol, our our contributions for the core protocol operate in about a quarterly cycle. That's right. Cool. Some of the really longer developments, like we're working, we've been working on the Condor release, formerly known to, as two point That Condor release has been in development for quite some time, right? It's it's a very big upgrade, not unlike uh, the Ethereum two point upgrade. It was, it's similar to that in terms of size and scope, maybe even bigger. Makes sense. It's one of those things, I guess, where you're sort of balancing that sort of um, shiny object syndrome in our space where people want to see progress. They want to see new, exciting things. But, you know, these things take a little while to cook, right? They do. And we have to we have to approach those contributions to the core protocol with a lot of um, responsibility and care. Um, understanding that there's a lot of people that are depending on the protocol to be uh, for robustness and uptime and performance. Um, and there's a lot of value locked in the protocol, right? So we have to treat it with, it's not like your typical software, uh, blockchain protocols, public, particularly public blockchain protocol infrastructure um, it has to be treated with a lot of care because a lot of people are depending on it. Well, you know, speaking on updates, uh, um, I, I'd love to sort of dive into the CEP 78 standard um, a little bit more. Um, when did that sort of concept come about and where are you now with that standard? The concept came about um, earlier in 2023. Um, I wanted to go beyond the you know, the wrote the basics, you know, ERC 721 standard, which just was the very basic, uh, you know, uh, NFT contract. And we have a flavor of that. It's called CEP 47. Um, and as we started talking to the community, it became very clear to us that there was a lot of things people want to do with NFTs. And what we felt is that we should make it very easy for developers to create any kind of NFT they wanted without having to fork the code base and create another standard. We felt that this would result in a lot of standard bloat, if you would, um, in the Casper ecosystem. So the developers came back with the CEP 78 standard, which is very innovative in its approach. Um, There is a single smart contract that allows you to create an NFT contract that has modalities or properties. And so it's for all intents and purposes, an audited standard that has is completely configurable, right? So it, because it's configurable, you can uh, install the contract and set the kinds of modalities you want it to use at installation. And voila, you've got a completely different NFT contract, right? So you can use a single contract to create NFTs for digital media or for KYC, or for authorization, or for uh, you know for uh, tickets, right? Um, you can set standards such as who can mint into the contract. Is it a s- single administrator that mints? Um, are the are the tokens transferable? Are they burnable? Are they non transferable? All of these different properties and modalities that people find very helpful because NFTs have. Very wide adoption, I believe. I believe NFTs are how we represent the world around us. Everything is non-fungible. And so there's a lot of utility, right? It's a very, very high utility contract. And being providing that flexibility out of the box, um, we felt was super important for developers, right? And it it takes it leverages the the capabilities of the underlying Casper protocol really beautifully as well. 
Yeah, that that's great. Um, so um, I can probably toot your horn better than or more appropriately than you can, but I'm very sort of aware of your keynote at NFTLA back in 2022, where you were talking about sort of the ability to sort of evolve the future of of traits and attributes and NFTs way before it became cool, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of projects in the Web3 space now where the NFTs can evolve over time, they can change, the attributes can change, or secret attributes and all of that. But back then in, in 2022, that was a very novel concept. And it seems like, you know, you're continuing to sort of do aggressive customer discovery to think about the use cases, not just in a year's time, but in five or 10 years time. That's right. Yep, that's exactly right. You know, we see enterprise software is software that needs to be configured, right? Any enterprise system you look at, it's all about configuration. It's taking a single chunk of software and configuring it and tailoring it to your use. Um, and, you know, other Web3 projects really haven't thought about it that way. Um, and so our CEP 78 standard, you know, it it really does provide a tremendous amount of simplicity, right? If you think you're building a DAP and you have to include and maintain all those libraries, all those smart contracts in your DAP, with Casper, it's just one. You just have to keep, pull in CEP 78. Once you have the CEP 78 standard in your DAP, then you can create as many different types of contracts you need in your DAP, and then what's more is you can upgrade them, right? You can securely upgrade these NFTs too, depending on what your future needs are as a business or as an application. Um, and we feel that that's the way software has always been made. And it's always, it's the way software has always been used by enterprises. So I'm really excited about it because, you know, it's a very innovative standard. I, and I think it has tremendous utility um, in the enterprise. And what's the sort of connecting pathways that are possible or not possible with um, you know, other protocols for, for this particular standard. Obviously, with an enterprise, um, control is important, so you have to sort of balance that. But I'm just kind of curious how you, how you look at interoperability. Definitely. So, you know, the CEP78 standard still has all the properties of NFTs, right? So there isn't anything preventing folks from bridging over NFTs that are minted on Casper over to other protocols if they want to. And there's already bridge infrastructure available on the public mainnet. So it's still a, it's still an NFT. It still has all the properties of NFT. Now, once you bridge the token, of course, you're then bound by the capabilities of the protocol onto which that token is bridged, right? But in terms of being able to bridge the NFTs over, it still follows the ERC-721 standard, right? So I believe, you know, a token protocol is a token protocol uh, and the CEP-78 standard provides you flexibility, but the tokens are still following the same token standard that you would expect. Makes a lot of sense. So let's sort of take this to the next stage and, and talk about some of the use cases and enterprises that sort of can benefit from, from this. Like when you think about, you know, the overall landscape, you know, I, I spoke with someone, I'm in Abu Dhabi at the moment. I spoke with someone today um, about, you know, blockchain and AI and what industries um, they see as most likely to be disrupted and, and they kind of took the easy route and they said every industry can be disrupted at this point by blockchain AI. Um, and if you're in any industry, you you have to think about using this type of technology. But but I'm not going to give you the easy, easy route. Like uh, we know that's <laughs> we know that's the case. But but let's get specific, because I think that's where um, things get really um, helpful for our audience to contextualize this type of technology. What are some examples of industries that you can think of that would benefit from this and some of the use cases within those industries? Definitely. So in terms of industries that I think are I think there's new industries that are crop up in addition to disruption of existing industries. Right. So when we talk about, uh, let's talk about a little bit about disruption, right? So when you think about what industries are going to be disrupted using specifically NFT technology, I'm finding that any industry where you have a custody solution that is separate from ownership. So if you have an asset that has specific custodial requirements that are separate from ownership, that ownership is not being tracked transparently in all probability, right? Because there just aren't good tools to do it today. So that ownership is not being tracked transparently. In that event, I would see that the way things are being done today are ripe for disruption, right? We're seeing a little bit of it with rare whiskey casks, 
We're seeing some of it with patent infrastructure. Both of these happening are on Cas on, are happening on Casper. You're seeing a little bit of it with real estate. Real estate doesn't really have a custodial problem, but it, it's not dissimilar to that. You're going to see that with gold. You're going to see that with, um, you know, any any asset that has a custodial requirement and ownership that are separate. It's ripe for disruption using NFT technology, right? Because now um, you can you can track ownership transparently even though you've got a custody provider, right? A custodial solution that's that's custodying those assets for you. There's an easy way to do a digital representation of that. You see a lot of that in real estate tokenization, um, although they're doing that for liquidity purposes to get liquidity. Um, so that is, that is a, a different type of use case, but also related because a lot of the real estate assets are also represented as NFTs and then in turn tokenized, right? We've also done some proof of concepts with automobile leases where the cars are represented mm -hmm. as NFTs and the NFTs are put inside and are governed by a leasing contract or NFTs are put into an auction and then governed by an auction and contract, right? So this is what Metacask uses our on-chain auction infrastructure. And the NFT is minted into the auction or the NFT contract exists within the auction and then only upon completion of the auction, the NFT is minted and then transferred to the owner. So this kind of capability um, I feel is, is really excellent use cases in terms of disruption, right, for, for NFTs. And do you see this as sort of helping companies generate more revenue? I think the the markets um, have all been impacted by whatever sort of um, landscape you want to call it. Is it a bear market? Is it a recession? Um, is it a slowdown, right? Um, but I think generating more revenue is the name of the game. Um, and whether that, or and also cutting costs, right? But but in, in both mm -hmm. regards, how can this type of technology be helpful? Yeah. So, I mean, I wouldn't say necessarily, I, I don't like to think about it or I don't think about it in terms of a bear market or a recession or anything like that. I think we're in the trough of disillusionment right now in the adoption curve. I think we're firmly entrenched in that trough. I feel like the trough is going to be a fairly long trough. Um, but we're finding that as we talk to enterprises, there's less and less conversations around, you should use a blockchain. It's more like, yes, we intend to use a blockchain, Right. This is what we're looking to do. So the education education is happening in enterprises. They're realizing the security benefits of blockchain technology and um, how to streamline it. I feel that, you know, there's going to be there's ongoing challenges around, you know, interoperability, capability. And if you think about, you know, just innovation budgets, right? So if you think about like, where does the recession play a role, much, much more than crypto, the recession plays a role in the uh, budgets in those organizations, right? Because an, an industry is only going to go mainstream. We've always maintained this un until an enterprise, like once enterprise adopts, enterprise will need to adopt. And only after that will a technology go mainstream, right? And enterprise adoption right now in blockchain is low because uh, innovation budgets have been hit, right? And a lot of the innovation budgets have turned to AI because the AI value proposition is very, very clear. It's very, very clear. With blockchain, the value proposition is a little bit more ephemeral. It's a little harder to imagine the new uh, revenue opportunities that could emerge or the, the cost savings that could emerge from the adoption of blockchain technology. And so I feel that it hasn't made itself evident yet, uh, which is why I think we're still in the trough of disillusionment, right? We, like, we haven't really gotten to the like mainstream adoption cycle yet. I still think we're like three to five years out, actually. Um, wow. I still think we have a good way to go. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I remember in 2019 when people were like, well, is mass adoption coming next year? I'm like, guys, I think it's 10 years away. And they're like, what? <laughs> like, yeah, I, st I still think we're three to five years out. But um, I think we, we could, we stuff. could, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that we couldn't see some examples of, of uh, brands that are generating more revenue from doing this enterprises that are right. Um, I think those use cases need to be developed, matured, you know, showcased during that time. Yeah, for sure, hundred percent. Like Metacask is developing new revenue. They they are working with, you know, uh, whiskey distillers, right? Who are recognizing one, they had a barrel management problem in the warehouse for track and trace, and so Metacask is coming to solve that problem. But then there's also a story that they tell, which each bottle, right? And so they're able to tell a really compelling story about the origin of your whiskey bottle, and they can tokenize it. 
right? So they can treat the cask as an NFT and they can fractionalize and tokenize that whiskey cask and tell a story to the end consumer. So it's a really compelling use case, right? And so MetaCask is out there disrupting the way whiskey is, you know, spirits are sold, right? Bought and sold. And and a lot of, the, like if you think about some of the high-end spirits, there's a story that you want to tell, right? And so NFT is perfect for that. Blockchain is perfect for that, for you to really be able to capture that story yeah, I just, uh, I and just, convey to the consumer and have that connection. Yeah, I was just um, listening to a, 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 another podcast talking about um, a spirit company in, um, I believe it was in Tokyo, that sort of has all these um, rare blends that might not be um, mass- audience but they could work really well for different niches and they're limited editions and when you start exactly. thinking about limited editions and special runs for segments of your community and how you segment those folks and reward them um things get fairly interesting when you blend that with with nft technology 100 percent, 100 percent. and i think i think the you know the spirits industry and the distilleries are definitely seeing this opportunity um to one build because they don't even have a one-to-one -one relationship with their customer right because every they're just they have a distributor that's in between, right? Mm -hmm. So when you start thinking about NFTs being used in the retail landscape, where you've got a manufacturer on one end, and this is the brand, and then you have the consumer here on the far end, and you have a distribution channel, the the brand doesn't actually own that relationship with the customer, right? And so an NFT is absolutely perfect, right? Uh, at at the point of the product for that brand to develop a one-to-one -one relationship with that customer, right? And then reward them and, and develop a community around that. That is a, like, this is something that brands are really, really interested in, uh, brands and businesses alike, right? And so like one of the products that we're building does, it is around brand loyalty, right? It's a brand loyalty, affiliate marketing, uh, points programs, building, you know, using the blockchain technology to dramatically streamline this and make it, really easy for brands to own their own information, right? To own their own marketing, to own that relationship directly yeah. with the consumer I, I is think, really, really interesting, right? Yeah, and kind of going back to my sort of consulting days and, and from having an e-commerce company, um, you get to a certain point of maturation um, and you know comp competition in any industry in any sort of product line where or product category where 1% longer customer lifetime value um, or 1% more sort of new customer referrals um, can can bring massive absolute sort of scalability to the company in the long run that 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 one percent you know compounds over over years and, and shifts the dynamic of that company and their consumer right for sure yeah for sure customer retention customer loyalty because acqu customer acquisition is really expensive right and so when you so that's, acquire another, a customer, that's another area where if you can bring that acquisition right. cost down by by creating reward programs that actually work, right? Like you think about Pepsi, you know, do they have any way to really measure if one Pepsi drinker gets three other Pepsi uh, drinkers hooked on their new product? No, but but right. could you do that theoretically with, with blockchain technology? Yeah, it, it, it's a yeah. possibility, absolutely. right? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, um, yeah. Very cool. Well, fun fun to kind of geek out with you um, a little bit on, on that type of stuff. Um, but for a, a lighter topic, um, you know, I, I have some FOMO. I have to admit, um, you know, I won't be at Davos this year. I really enjoyed um, participating in, in, in your Davos sort of experience uh, in years past and getting to know each other and meeting all sorts of cool people. Um, what what are you up to this year at, at the upcoming Davos Hub, and and you know what kind of NFT centric content can attendees expect? Yeah, so we are going to have some really cool and exciting NFT content uh, at Davos. Um, it's going to be called the Hub this year, and uh, we've got some really amazing partners that are coming in as well. We're really excited. Um, so if you happen to be in Davos, uh, check it out. Come visit us. Bring a friend. Uh, better yet, bring an enterprise. If you if you have enterprises that are interested in looking at blockchain technology, bring them on into the to the hub over in Davos. We're really excited about uh, you know the really cool NFT content we're going to be showcasing. Um, it's going to be any, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, 
you, you managed to effectively avoid details. Is there, and, and is, I, I would not uh, be in this business if I didn't sort of follow up and just say, is there any, any hints of, of what's to come that you can share? I can't share any hints just right now. All I can tell you is that we're, we're super stoked about what's going to, what's coming up though. I'm very excited about it. All right. Well, fair enough. And of course, um, when, when you do have the details, we'll, we'll share it with our audience and, um, of course, you know, thank of you for, for leaving us all on the, the, the tip of our seats <laughs> for, for now. Um, well, uh, you're, you're sort of a, a jack of all trades technologist in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, I, it wouldn't be sort of um, a contemporary conversation if we didn't talk about AI as well a little bit, right? Um, you know, it, it's been a, an adventure to say the least with with Sam Altman and OpenAI the last uh, few weeks. And mm -hmm. um, I guess he's back. He's back in the saddle, right? I think that's the latest news. Um, hopefully it hasn't changed when this show airs. Um, <laughs> but, but um you know, I'm sure you're following that pretty pretty carefully. Any any thoughts on on what happened there, and, and sort of what sort of mark markings um, come from that sort of um, open AI um, sort of uh, roller coaster ride? I think it's I think it's highlighting a topic that's really I think it's it's highlighting a topic that's front in mind for all of us in in blockchain, and that you know anyone that operates in a public blockchain, you think about governance, right? And this is why Casper Labs is really focused on responsible AI and responsible AI governance, because this is the crux of the whole Sam Altman thing, is the governance, is governing of the open AI, right? And it's one of the reasons why we partnered with IBM to develop uh, a product and an initiative around responsible AI, namely with Watson X. And the reason for that is, you know, individuals and companies and organizations, all of us, we need to care about how AI evolves. And, you know, you think about when everybody thinks about AI, those that are concerned about, like, people are either really excited about AI, it's like, oh, all the amazing things to do, or people are really, really concerned about AI because all they think about is Skynet, right? And, you know, the Skynet thing could be a real thing. Like the way that AI is progressing rapidly, right? There's definitely concerns around can you trust content that you see online now that it's not ai generated because the generative ai is so amazing these days that you really can't tell right looking at something you really can't tell if it's real or fake and that's just a microcosm of future challenges to come if we don't have public open ais that are responsibly governed right in a decentralized way i fully maintain that ai needs to have decentralized responsible governance. And I feel that, you know, in in the blockchain space, we've demonstrated our ability, um, albeit fledgling, but we've demonstrated an ability to govern systems, right? Such as Bitcoin mm. and Ethereum and Casper, we can govern those systems and, you know, have a significant amount of value locked in those systems. And I think that's a testament to what is possible in terms of, you know, decentralized open governance of something like an AI. And I believe you can put a blockchain in front of an AI and you can use that blockchain and the community associated with that blockchain to responsibly govern that AI. Uh, and I think it's really incumbent upon us as a species to think about that. Yeah, that is, it's fascinating. A lot, of, a lot of blockchain companies are looking at AI and sort of how to integrate it into how, maybe how they do their coding or gaming companies are looking at AI and, and in different ways, obviously, um, you know, folks like Toonstar have have improved their social sort of um, engagement using AI. But what you're talking about is is more fundamental, right? It, mm -hmm. it, it's yeah. it's it's it is the sort of pink elephant in in the room with with AI, and it's a use case for for blockchain that I, I don't think has been discussed that much um, thus far. Again. Um, sounds like something you guys are really sort of um, on the edge and in, in with with regard to you. and um, did did some of this sort of thinking come out of your recent um, you know survey that you did on ethical AI? I guess you guys looked at talked to six hundred different enterprise leaders. Um, did that sort of shape your opinion here at all? And and what were some of the other findings? Yeah, like you know we 
we saw this study, you know, and we love to uh, leverage AI workflows, right? So that was the big takeaway, right? Is that enterprises really love leveraging AI because I, like I said, the return on investment is very obvious, right? Is very, very clear in terms of uh, yeah. increasing efficiency, right? But yeah, which the flip is, which side is, is- Which is critical. I mean, it's not a fun right. topic to to think about sort of efficiency, um, but but in 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 economic times like we have right now, it, it's critical to think about efficiency, in, and that's yep. what's going to stimulate the economy again. That's right, a hundred percent. Like I found through many cycles that even though you have technology that you know creates a level of efficiency, and there's some concern about pruning back, right? This pruning back of human-led resources, right? And when you talk about when you talk in the enterprise, look, they're looking to either save costs or increase revenue. It's very, very simple, right? And when you talk about saving costs, usually they're talking about saving headcount, operational efficiency, right? But then those individuals can go and do other things. So what I'm saying is that every time you see an improvement in efficiency, you see actually an economic boom, right? On the on the heels of that, right? I completely agreeing with you. And I think that AI is going to bring about the same thing. There's going to be a, a big economic boom as a result of AI new products and services, new capabilities. I think you're going to see these billion dollar companies that are run by two and three people um, because they're using AI right behind the scenes. So you're going to see these ultra I, I, I micro remember. startups, right? Yeah. And that's a, a rarity. I, I'm, I'm remembering like this dating app, OkCupid, that I think got bought by um, one of the bigger dating app companies. And they had like an extremely small team. And sort of you think about like the, the Tim Ferriss four hour work week. I, I think that becomes a more achievable reality for for more and more entrepreneurs and companies and it maybe brings down breaks down some of the barriers to entrepreneurship um because you know I, I consider those of us that are in that space you know masochists by nature but but I've always wondered does it have to be that way right um you know and in and, and you know what you're talking about is 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 along those lines and I have a friend that showed me a tool that you know will look at your your entire DNA of your company through your website and, and spit back recommendations for marketing strategies, communication strategies, competitive analysis, all, all within like minutes. So it, yeah. it starts to make you wonder what is possible down the road. A hundred percent. Absolutely. And I think the key is, you know, from our perspective is you don't want those AIs to one, be co-opted and to trained in a manner that they stop delivering value. Right. And I think that's, that's really where, you can think about it like a versioning control system, right? For an AI, right? That's that's what we're looking to build. And and taking that one step further, then if you have an open AI that's governed by community, that's where the blockchain really does uh, kind of step into, you know, center stage um, around, you know, its ability to govern, right? To that, That's what they do. They govern the states of VMs. Blockchains govern the states of virtual machines. And so why couldn't they govern the state of an of an AI? They absolutely could. Makes sense. Um, well, this has been fun. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to the pictures and highlights from, from Davos. Um, but before we wrap, I just was curious, um, what's next on the radar of Casper Labs um, that you can talk about? I can definitely talk about some of the protocol upgrades that we've got. So we're very excited about the Peregrine release that is coming here very shortly. Um, it's in testing right now, and that's going to deliver faster block times, right? So we've heard from the community that they want, obviously, everybody wants more performance, and we're always looking at performance. So we'll be shortening the block Everyone times. Everyone wants to go Casper. faster in life, right? Everyone wants to go faster. Yeah, but we can't sacrifice security for that. So we're going to go faster. Um, and then, of course, Condor is coming. Uh, it'll be available for customer preview in December. And so smart contract authors and projects that are building on Casper will get the first sneak peek of the Condor release, which is due to release middle of next year, in preparation for you know pretty big seismic shifts um, for smart contract developers. We're very, very excited about that release. So stay and, tuned. And what, what, what is that? Like, what does that mean in terms of seismic shifts? Like, what what what's going to be possible there? What well, so some of the things that are going to be possible is you'll have contracts that can pay for their own computation, contracts that can stake the network, which opens up a whole new world for any kind of DeFi contracts, right? They can they can take advantage of of inbuilt network staking as well. Contracts that can do multi-signature upgrades, right? So all the properties of accounts on Casper will now be transferred to contracts as well. So it'll 
open up that's, and a that's lot of really interesting. enterprises that that yes. you know um they have changes of of staff changes of boards changes of governance changing of authorities um yep you know people get fired people leave organizations you need you need some flexibility there right hundred percent. Yeah. And that's something that Casper does provide natively, right? So we provide that with a really robust account structure that allows you to manage access to, to contracts on the chain completely separate from the contract code itself, right? So you don't have to build white lists into your contract, but having contracts that pay for themselves makes it possible for individuals to sign transactions and then the contract covers the cost, right? So when you think about streamlining the user experience, um, of, of interacting with public networks, this becomes very important, right? And Casper will also become gasless, right, with, with the Condor release. So all transaction fees will be refunded to the user. So your net cost will be zero, right, for using the chain. So there's uh, really uh, a lot of exciting capabilities. And we're going to shorten block times again. Uh, the intent is to get to one second block times with with Condor, right? So um, that's, that's a huge, huge uh, change. We'll be probably one of the only protocols that will upgrade consensus within the first four years of launch. Wow. And uh, it will be a brand new, brand new consensus protocol with, uh, with the Condor release. So it's big, yeah, <laughs> very big, big. And on top of that, you're, you're moving. Um, like, you know, I, 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 I do wonder if you're secretly building your own AI persona to, to <laughs> manage all, all of this uh, development. I have, you know, we have a phenomenal set of core engineers for the Casper protocol. Um, they need no guidance. They know what they need to do. They know what their mission is and they, they get it done, right? They get it done responsibly. They get it done thoughtfully um, and, and they get it done, you know, with, with incredible care, right? So they don't need a lot of handholding. They have a mission and they know that what they need to get done and they go do it. And we have an amazing, amazing group of core developers for the protocol. That's great. That's great. Um, well, shout out to them. And this was fun. Obviously, folks can go to casperlabs.io to, to learn a little bit more. Um, but if they want to go really deep down the rabbit hole and get more technical, um, where do you send folks usually? Go to casper.network and you can look at the documentation and the developer portal if you want to get really, really technical and go really deep into, into the protocol. That's where That's where the developer portal is. So casper.network and check out the developer docs. Cool. Um, well, this was really fun. I uh, appreciate your, your time um, in the midst of all this stuff going on in the holidays and whatnot. Um, we'll, we'll have another episode of Edge of Casper sooner than later. Um, for now, we've reached the outer limit at the Edge of NFT for today. Thanks for exploring with us. We've got space for more adventures on the Starship. So invite your friends, recruit some cool strangers that'll make this journey all so much better. How go to Spotify or iTunes right now, rate us and say something awesome, then go down, then go to edgeofnft.com to dive further down the rabbit hole. Look us up on all major social platforms by typing edge of NFT with no spaces and start a fun conversation with us online. And lastly, be sure to tune in next time for more great N NFT content. Thanks again for sharing this time with us today. Thanks, Meta. Thanks, Josh. The views and opinions expressed on Edge of NFT reflect solely those views and opinions of the show hosts and its guests. Please make sure to do your own research. Our show is not financial advice. You understand that you are using any and all information available on or through this podcast at your own risk. Whenever making financial decisions, we recommend doing your own research and talking to your accountant for financial advice. From time to time, we may feature sponsored content on the show for which we receive value, and we may share links for which we receive a commission if you make a purchase through one of those links. Refer to our website, www.edgeofnft.com, for our full disclaimer, terms and conditions, and privacy policy.